We're thankful for that. We're going to miss Wayne and Lita as they're soon to depart from us. I think this will be the last week they'll be with us for a while. So we look forward to their return. Appreciate uh, the good effort that uh, was made by uh, CJ this morning in his uh, song leading. Uh, did a great job and uh, he had a good song, good song service, so we appreciate that as well. It's our prayer to God that uh, those of you that are watching us on the internet, that uh, you'll pay close attention to what we have to say and if there's anything that we say or do that uh, you are not familiar with or that you would like to know more about, that you would contact us, you can do so for by contacting us at the North Sumner Church at gmail.com. We'd be glad to answer any question and get back with you as uh, uh, concerning those questions. You know, um, I guess uh, when I was a teenager, about 15 years old, I guess, is when I first learned about some issues that uh, there were among churches of Christ. This was back in the mid-50s, so I'm dating myself there, but uh, it's uh, been going on. Uh, uh, various issues in the church have been going on for a number of years. Uh, there has been a controversy among some as to what the church can and cannot do and so far is its work and worship is concerned. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, when things are brought up uh, that uh, uh, people might object to, there is usually uh, the answer is, uh, but it's a good work. Rather than giving a, a, a book chapter and verse for it, they would say that, well, it's, it's just a, it, it is a good work. Um, and I would agree uh, with those who say that it is a good work. There's no question but what it is a good work. But the question is, does the Bible say that that's a good reason for doing something? We want to look at some passages in the Bible uh, this morning and uh, talk about uh, this idea. And I, I would want to try to show you why, whenever we try to justify what we do in our work and our worship of the church, that uh, the excuse, it's a good work, uh, is not that which God would be pleased with. Now, I also would suggest to you that the Bible does say that we are to do good works. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Now, obviously, Jesus is saying that we need to do good works. Also in Ephesians 2 and in verse 10, we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. We could talk about other passages, Galatians, the sixth chapter, do good unto all men, especially those who are of the household of faith. James 1, verse 27, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit uh, the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keep oneself unspotted from the world. So these passages and others that we could quote very clearly show that uh, we have a responsibility to do good works. But also we might notice in each of those passages that I quoted, that these have to do with what the individual Christian is to do. You notice in Ephesians 2 and verse 10, especially there, he says that we are His workmanship, that is, you and I that are Christians, those of us who have been born again. Uh, we are created in Christ Jesus for good works. In other words, we're, that's what God has created us for, is to do good works. And you notice he says, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Uh, God has not left it up to us what a good work is. God has not left it up to us to decide what to do. He has told us what to do in His Word. And so uh, with that uh, in mind, I would like for us to, uh, to look at the, um, some passages in the, the Bible, in the Old Testament, 
concerning uh, the excuse that was made, uh, it's a good work. And to see what God had to say about that excuse. One of those uh, examples that I would like for us to look at is uh, concerning David and his desire to build a, uh, a temple to the Lord. Uh, we'll find that uh, David had a great idea. Uh, he was living well in his uh, uh, sealed house, his uh, cedar, made of cedar, uh, living in luxury, and God was out there somewhere living in a tent. Or at least that was his uh, statement that he made in regard to it. Look at 2 Samuel, the seventh chapter. I uh, want to look at the first seven verses. 2 Samuel chapter 7, and beginning at verse 1. Now it came to pass when the king was dwelling in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan uh, the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells inside tent curtains. Then Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Notice that. Nathan said, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But it happened that night that the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build a house for me to dwell in? For I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought the children of Israel up from Egypt, even to this day, but have moved about in a tent and in a tabernacle. Now look at verse 7. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now what we learn here is that um, David thought that he was doing a good thing. Uh, and I think all of us here this morning would probably say that would have been a good thing. Here the Lord, uh, the God of heaven, is out there living in a tent when the king of Israel is living in a beautiful house. And uh, we would all agree with that, I think. As a matter of fact, if you notice what uh, Nathan said, Nathan even got caught up in this idea. Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. Now the Lord hadn't told him to do that. I don't know where he got his idea. But I guess he thought it was such a good idea that it would be okay. And uh, so he said uh, he, he approves what David is thinking about doing. That is of uh, building a temple. But uh, obviously uh, this was not something that uh, he should have been doing. And you notice in that passage that, that he says that, uh, let me go back to that. Wherever I have moved about with all the children of Israel, have I ever spoken a word to anyone from the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? What he's saying here is, I have never mentioned that to anybody. I have never suggested that to anyone, that I would want a, a temple built at this particular time. And um, so we see very clearly that what he was wanting to do was not something that God authorized. It was not that which God uh, had, uh, had said that he wanted done. We find later on that um, that, that was exactly uh, the case with Solomon. God uh, told Solomon uh, that he wanted uh, a house built. And uh, he gave him specific direction as to how that it was to be done. Uh, we find uh, in the book of Exodus, chapter 25, this is concerning the tabernacle in, in verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary, that I may dwell among them according to all that I show you 
That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishing, just as you shall make it. So the same thing applied not only to the tabernacle, but also to the temple. But it was not in God's uh, plan of things for David to be the one to build the tabernacle. And so what uh, David did on this occasion was in fact presumptuous. It was something that he thought would have been a good idea. And as I said, I think all of us here would have agreed, would have agreed with that. It would have been a good idea. But the fact is that it was not according to God's plan. It was a good work that he desired to do, but it was not by the authority of God. So let's look at another passage, another uh, event in the life of David. Uh, this one uh, is uh, regarding uh, David's desire to return the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, we learn from uh, a study of the history of the Israelites that uh, the Philistines had uh, captured the Ark of the Covenant uh, back several years uh, previous to this. And uh, during, actually during the time of uh, uh, Saul, King Saul, uh, and they had not had any dealings with the Ark of the Covenant for a number of years. And um, let's look at what uh, David had in mind here in regard to this particular event. In 1 Chronicles, the 13th chapter, beginning in verse 1, Then David consulted with the captains of thousands and hundreds, and with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you, and if it is of the Lord uh, our God, uh, let us send out to our brethren everywhere who are left in all of the land of Israel, and with them to the priests and the Levites, who are in their cities and their common lands, that they may gather together to us. And let us bring the ark of our God back to us. For we have not inquired as it, uh, at it since the days of Saul. Uh, the, uh, the ark of the covenant was that area or that place where the priests would go in and would, uh, would speak to the Lord on occasions. Uh, then all the assembly said that they would do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. Now it seems to me that up to here that uh, again we would agree with this. All of us would agree that this is a thing that would have been right to do. It would have been what we refer to as a good work. So David gathered all Israel together from uh, uh, Shiror in Egypt to as far as the entrance of Hamath, to bring the ark of God from Kirja Jeram. And David and all Israel went up to Baal, uh, Bela, to Kirja Jeram, which belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God to the Lord, or God the Lord, who dwells between the cherubim, where his name is proclaimed. So they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Ahoah drove the cart. Now everything seems to be pretty good up to this point. It was a good idea. Uh, David consulted with uh, a lot of people uh, around uh, his nation, uh, made them a part of his plan, uh, and uh, everything went very well up to this point. But something happened from the time that they actually picked the cart up to the time that they got to where, or almost got to where they were uh, supposed to, to go, and to, to bring it, to deliver it. And um, we find that in verse 9 and 10 of 1 Chronicles 13. And when they came to Chidon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to hold the ark, for the ox stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and he struck him because he put his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. Now what's going on here? Why in the world would God act 
such a way as this. Why did God uh, cause Uzzah to be struck dead? Well, we won't get the answer here, but we will get the answer whenever we go back and look at some Old Testament history. For instance, in Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, and in verse 8, At that time the Lord separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, to stand before the Lord, to minister Him, and to bless in His name to this day. You notice here he says, He separated the tribe of Levi to bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord. They were to carry the Ark of the Covenant. David had made a new cart. You noticed that in those verses previous that we looked at. He had made a new cart. Now David um, obviously thought that he was doing the right thing whenever he did that. And uh, we'll mention that more in just a minute. But also let's go on and look at uh, some more instruction that we find uh, in the Old Testament previous to this in regard to uh, the uh, Ark of the Covenant. In verse 9 of uh, chapter 7 of the book of Numbers, But to the sons of Korah he gave none, because there was the service of the holy things which he carried, or which they carried on their shoulders. And what he's talking about there, previous verses of, of this chapter, uh, he had uh, given certain numbers of oxen and uh, carts, to the different tribes uh, of uh, uh, Israel. But to the tribe of Levi, to this, the sons of Korah, he didn't give any. And the reason was that he did not want them to carry these items that they had been uh, would, uh, given the assignment to do uh, in a cart. They were to carry them on their shoulders. And um, we find also that um, God had made special provision for the Ark of the Covenant. Now here's somebody's uh, uh, imagination, I guess. Nobody knows exactly what the Ark of the Covenant looks like, but it may have looked something similar to this. But one of the things that was unique about it is that it uh, had uh, uh, rings, two rings on each side, and long poles that were to be placed between them. And there's very clear instructions as to how these things were to be made. And that's how it was to be carried. That's how it was carried. Uh, all the, during the time of uh, their wilderness wandering, all during the time that they went over into uh, the land of Canaan, and ultimately uh, before they lost the ark to the uh, Philistines. So here we have an incident that, uh, again, is hard to explain other than the fact that they did not do what God would have them to do. We find another verse that might help us even further in Numbers 4 and verse 15. It says, and, the, and when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the camp is set to go, then the sons of Kohath shall come to carry them, but they shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. Now that was God's direction. They shall not touch any holy thing, lest they die. These are the things in the tabernacle of beating, which the sons of Kohath are to carry. So one of those things would have been the Ark of the Covenant. No one was to touch it. So what we learn from this is that God told the Israelites specifically, who was to carry it, how they were to carry it, and that they were not to touch it. But uh, either David did not know about this, uh, or David knew about it and thought he knew better. And so he made a new cart. That was what he decided to do. And you know, uh, his excuse could have been, now it doesn't really say that uh, that was his excuse, that he did make that excuse, but it could have been, well, this is a good work. And you know, actually, after all, uh, their trip that they're going to have to carry this ark, it's going to have to be a nine to 10 mile journey. And it's not a real pleasant journey at, at that. 
And the Ark of the Covenant is really heavy. Uh, somebody has uh, done some calculating, and I'm not sure whether it's correct or not, but they said it could have weighed anywhere from 300 to 600 pounds. So that's a heavy load for four people to carry. And, uh, but, but this is what um, probably what David had in mind, that he was going to help these people out. He was going to give them uh, relief from this burden by putting it on a cart and allowing the oxen to pull it. Well, obviously, God is not pleased with that. And we find that um, in 1 Chronicles 15, uh, verse 11, uh, that uh, whenever this happened, whenever this uh, event happened where uh, Uzzah got killed by God, uh, we find uh, David one more time decides that he's going to try to get the ark back to Jerusalem. And uh, verse, verse 11 in 1 Chronicles 15, we read these words. And David called for Zodak and uh, by Ab Abiathar the priest, and for the Levites, for Ural, uh, Asia, Joel, Shemaiah, Elael, and Ammonadab, <laughs> he said to them, You are the heads of the families, the fathers' houses of the uh, of Levites. Sanctify yourself, you and your brethren, that you may bring up the Ark of the Covenant of Israel to the place I have prepared for it. But now look what he says. And because you did not do this the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not consult Him about the proper order. Then in verse 14 says, And the priests and the Levites sanctified themselves to bring up the ark of the, to the Lord God of, of the Lord God of Israel. And the children of the Levites bore the ark of God on their shoulders by its poles as Moses had commanded according to the word of the Lord. Now, David apparently, uh, he, he, he puts the blame on these people. Uh, at least at the first, he says, for because you did not do it the first time. In other words, you didn't you didn't come and tell me that this is the way it, would, it should have been done. And then he said, because we did not counsel him about the proper order. He puts himself to blame as well. We did not counsel him about the proper order. Now, this was a good thing. Everybody would, have, would agree that it was a good work that David wanted to do to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. What was the problem? They didn't do it according to the way God had specified for it to be carried, for it to be done. Now, you know, we might ask the question, why in the world is all of this, these verses in the Old Testament, why is it, uh, there's so much time spent in regard to this one particular event. Well, I think Paul answers that, and uh, it's, it's for us to understand. In Romans 4, 15 and verse 4, he says, For whatever things were written beforehand were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. So he says that these things in the Old Testament were written for our learning. What do we learn of then about these two things that we're talking about this morning? What we learn is that it is important to do the way God tells us to do things. We must do things by His authority. And when we fail to do that, we must suffer the consequences. We may not suffer the consequences like um, these people did, uh, an instant uh, uh, event that took place where they were struck dead, but someday we'll have to suffer the consequences if we fail to do what God tells us to do and by, by His authority. But let's look at a couple of examples in the, the New Testament. One passage that I want to look at is Matthew chapter 7 and at verse 21 beginning. 
passage all of us, I'm sure, are familiar with. About every one of us here could, could quote it by heart. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now here are people, we're not specifically told uh, exactly who these people were, but they were people who were calling on the Lord. They were people who were believing that they were doing what God wanted them to do. Matter of fact, they're, they're doing some pretty great things here. Uh, prophesying and casting out demons and doing many wonders. But look what Jesus said. I will tell, uh, declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now that word lawlessness is an interesting word. It comes from the Greek word anomia. And uh, the negative form of anomia is nomos. And nomos means law. In the Greek, the word nomos means law. And that A or the alpha in the Greek that precedes a nomos means that which is unlawful or without authority. Now these people were doing a great work. Someone might say it was a good work, but it was that which was without authority. Now, whenever we think about this in regard to things that go on in the world today, especially in the religious world, I wonder how many people would be under the condemnation of this verse. How many people is the Lord going to say, Depart from me, I never knew you? Because they are doing things because of what they want to do and not what God would have them to do. So God has told man what he expects from him. God uh, expects us to do that which he has told us to do. He doesn't give us the option to make up things as we go along and to say, well, I enjoy doing this. I enjoy doing that. I like this and I like that. And I don't care what God says. Well, we don't really say that out loud. But that's really what we're saying. Whenever we do things without God's authority, that's exactly what we are saying. I'm reminded of the words of the wise man in Proverbs 14 and verse 12. He said, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. You know, we can... We can devise all kinds of schemes where we think we are pleasing to God. But the fact is, if we have not been giving the authority to do those things, then they are useless. They are things that uh, are of no benefit to us whatsoever. I mean, let's look at another verse in Colossians 3 and in verse 17. Paul writes to the Colossian church there, and he said, And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Whatever you do in word or, or in deed, in word would be our teaching, in deed would be our practice. If we are doing that which we cannot find book, chapter, and verse for it, it's not going to do us any good to say it's a good work. Somebody comes up and questions you about why do you do certain things, and you say, well, it's a good work. It's a good thing that we're doing. God's not pleased with that. God will not accept that. This idea here of doing all in the name of the Lord, is to do by His authority. When a policeman knocks on the, your door in the middle of the night 
And he says, open up in the name of the law. He's saying, I have the authority to demand that. When Jesus says, do all in the name of the Lord, he has the authority to do that. He demands that of us and he expects it of us. And no more and no less. Let me close with one last verse in Revelation chapter 22. There's a warning there at the very end of the book. It said, For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the, this, the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life from the holy city and from the things that are written in this book. Now I realize and I understand that this was a statement that was made specifically about the book of Revelation. But it presents a principle that is found throughout the pages of the Word of God. When we do something and we cannot give book, chapter, and verse for it, then God is not pleased with us and He is not, and it is not acceptable unto Him. And we haven't said anything this morning about what you need to do in order to be saved. But the same principle applies. Those of you that are in our audience this morning and our uh, uh, internet audience, uh, perhaps you have, are, are of the belief that uh, in what is known as the sinner's prayer. Pray the sinner's prayer and you will be saved. I would ask you to find book, chapter, and verse for that. Give me a passage of scripture that shows you that that's what you're supposed to do. But I'll show you what the Bible teaches about it. God's plan of salvation is not hard to understand. It's not hard to do. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We have to have faith in Christ as the Son of God. We must be willing to repent of our sins. We must be willing to confess Jesus as Lord before men. And we must be willing to be baptized into Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of those sins. Baptism is where you come in contact with the blood of Christ. Baptism is that which the Bible says does save us. It's not a work of man. It's not something that we earn, but it's that which God requires of us. God's grace is conditional, and it's conditional upon what He has told us to do. If you need to obey the gospel, if you're not a child of God, if you're not a Christian, you need to do that as we have just outlined this morning. We can give book, chapter, and verse for that. There are the, the schemes uh, of men that have been devised over the years cannot be uh, justified from what the Bible has to say. So if you're here and uh, present this morning and need to obey the gospel, we would encourage you to come right now as we stand and as we sing. Won't you please come?